This podcast contains material that is intended for mature audiences and may not be suitable for all listeners. Enjoy. I don't want to get on the bandwagon. I'll burn that wagon down and join the band. Traveling troubadours, terrorizing street corners just to try to get some supper in our hands. Now I waited all my life to get this off my chest screen, buddy murder until someone understands that it ain't about the money, the drugs, or the women. I make this noise just because I can. And we'll all join in to that original sin. So let's get rowdy and rowdy. Let me tell you something you already know. The world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. It's a very mean and nasty place, and I don't care how tough you are, it will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. You, me, or nobody is going to hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. Pain is temporary. It may last for a minute, or an hour, or a day, or even a year. But eventually, it will subside, and something else will take its place. If I quit, however, it will last forever. Hello, and welcome back to another edition of Old Man Strength, a podcast of the Tailgate Society and brought to you by Deadeye Barbecue Sauce, the best damn barbecue sauce in the known universe. As always, I am Tim Johnson, joined by Chris Shipley. Chris, how are we doing tonight? Hey, good evening, Tim. Doing well. Doing well. You have a you have good holiday with the family? Yeah, we did. Uh, <clears throat> Tyler was over. Uh, Caitlin was back. So we had a nice, small little gathering Christmas uh, Eve into Christmas Day and did a Zoom call with my family. And so not your typical Christmas, but... It was because there wasn't large Christmas family gatherings. Uh, all the kids were here for the entire day. So normally, Caitlin and Tyler have to go somewhere else in the middle of the day, and then the boys would go to their dads, but that didn't happen until the next day. So it was one of the few Christmases where we had the kids here all day long. So Oh, that, that'd be nice, yeah. Yeah, it was nice. Yeah, I think I mentioned on the, on the last podcast that, that kind of a family tradition is, is decorating cookies. And since we didn't get to see my parents and, and, you know, my sisters and their kids and do that, then we tried doing a decorate cookies together over Zoom on Christmas Day, which it was fun to be able to do. But trying to get what that there's nine grandkids, eight adults all together to, to try to uh, have a Zoom call is a little bit hectic. Uh, a little bit chaotic, but I think I think my folks enjoyed seeing all their grandkids uh, decorating. I know my daughter was really sad that we didn't get to travel and, and see all of her her cousins, so she was uh, having a lot of fun doing that. So it was it was definitely like you said, non traditional, definitely not uh, anything like what we are used to. But but it was a good time. Yeah, my mom hopped on the Zoom call maybe five minutes <laughs> <laughs> so but it was nice uh it was nice to see her and and uh, Tyler and Caitlin and I had driven over there that morning just to drop off a gift and say hi to her real quick so I at least got to to see her for a couple minutes so yeah that's that's nice I you know my I've mentioned that my my sister's uh, live really close to my folks. And I think, you know, they've stopped off the drop off presents or something like that, but you know, they've really been trying to be, be careful about distancing my, my folks with, you know, whatever health issues they have I've certainly been trying to be uh, deliberate with it. So I, I, I have to imagine once we get through all this and get vaccinated that uh, we'll probably be hanging out so much that we'll be sick of each other pretty quickly just by the sheer amount we'll be wanting to hang out but certainly certainly miss them uh certainly wish that i could be you know in the same room with them um, yeah 
but I'm not going to lie. I was not sad to not have to travel. Uh, <laughs> like right. The, I don't remember if it was the 23rd or the 24th. We got a, a big storm come through here. And I was like, man, I am very happy to not be, be on the road trying to drive down to Iowa by any means. Uh, I've, I've white knuckled a few Christmas drives. Yeah. They're never, they're never any fun. Yeah, uh, no, I don't necessarily worry too much about it. It's the anxiety in the car from the other people in the car. <laughs> you know, like I, I can make it just, you guys just need to calm down. <laughs> yeah. Get yeah. All irritated. Or you're going to get me all worked up and then that's the problem. I was I was lamenting uh, the other day that they don't have winter's driver's ed as a requirement, uh, you know, particularly up here in Minnesota, because it sure seems like there's an awful lot of people that that are driving like they've never seen snow in their life. <laughs> Whenever I go out on the road uh, these days, you know, well, it, when I everything from the, you know, I was gonna say everything from the the ultra aggressive drivers that you, you know, fly past you at 80 that you see in the, in the ditch a mile down the road to the people that are overly cautious and they're going, you know, 30 on the, on the freeway. And they're probably going to cause just as many accidents by going too slow as too fast. Stacy told me today, she read a, a story. Some guy in Minneapolis was heading back to school. Yeah, uh, yesterday, the day before, during the snowstorm, and, and got clocked at 110 miles an hour. And I was like, "Well, number one, school's out, <laughs> so I don't know where that guy's going." And second of all, wh- who who goes 110 miles an hour during the middle of a snowstorm? That's insane. I I mean, it's insane when it's the middle of a of summer with no traffic and yeah. no rain or whatever. But yeah, in the middle of all of this. Uh, I can't, I can't even imagine. I mean, all it's going to take is, is one bad patch. And let's be honest, uh, one year, the Minnesota DOT ran out of their snowplow budget for the entire winter in like the first three weeks of winter, uh, which I don't know if you're familiar with winter in Minnesota, but it's a lot longer than three weeks. It's a lot longer than three months. Uh, sometimes it feels like it's damn near three quarters of the year. Uh, but <laughs> I was warned. I was warned when I made the mistake one time of saying, hey, this Duluth place is pretty nice. I wouldn't mind living here. And the guy's like, you don't want to live here. And I was like, why? It was like August. It was like 75 degrees. It was beautiful. And the guy's like, because when it snows, the snow hits that lake and it dumps snow for four days straight. So trust me, you don't want to live here. Yeah, up there. That yeah, you're lake, right. I don't want any part of that. Yeah, that lake affects snow up there. I, I, I don't want to deal with it all. And then they'll, they'll still be the one that, like, you know, it's finally gotten warm down here, fifty degrees overnight low in 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 the the lower thirties, and then it'll be like an international falls hit seven degrees for a high today, and like, oh, okay, <laughs> no, man, I I hate the six months that that we have of winter here. I wouldn't want the nine and a half months they have up there. <laughs> um, the older I get, the less tolerant of snow and and uh, winter and winter driving and traffic. It's it's a bitch getting old. It's, it's, it's as my dad said, getting old isn't for sissies. <laughs> I, I, yeah, it's a pain in the ass. No, I, I, you know, I, I got up this morning to, you know, we had some storm, not, not really a storm. It was maybe four to six inches that fell yesterday and uh and you know through to this morning and so i got up to to go clear the driveway and clear the sidewalk and and uh, i was certainly just really really grumpy and grumbling all about it uh but by by this afternoon it, it got to be perfectly pleasant it was in the upper 20s the sun was out my daughter and I took the dog for a walk and I'm like, Oh, this winter isn't so bad. <laughs> uh, and then just now I was like, Oh man, it is so cold. Where's that electric blanket? I don't know how I'm going to sit in the oh. basement and record a podcast at this cold. So I, uh, yeah, my tolerance yeah. is pretty low. <laughs> I had, I had not ever had a snowblower. I'm 50 years old. I'd not ever had a snowblower. It's always been a shovel. Well, and when I was married to my first wife, and I was pretty heavy. I didn't even shovel. I just drove a groove into the driveway with my car <laughs> so that I could get back and forth. 
Yeah. And that was good enough for me. But as I got older and smarter, I was like, well, that's pretty stupid. So I should at least shovel. You know, last year down here, we got snow. It was all the fucking time. Like at oh, some yeah. point, the snow was piled up higher than my fucking mailbox. And I was out there. And every year, I would say, I really want a snowblower. And Stacy's like, well, I kind of like doing shoveling because I like the exercise. And she does. I mean, she like, you know, when she would go out there, she, it didn't bother her. Sure. So... <laughs> I don't know. I was over the whole fucking shoveling thing last year. I was <laughs> over it. And I'm shoveling and she comes outside and she goes, uh, she goes, where's the other shovel? And I said, I think it's in there somewhere. And she goes, well, did you buy a new one? And I turned around and I go, no. Cause the next fucking thing I'm buying when it comes to snow is a fucking snow blower. <laughs> <laughs> and we had been talking about buying a dishwasher and she goes, well, would you rather spend money on a new dishwasher or a snowblower? And I just, I don't know. I, Melvin came out and I go, look, see those fucking people down the street blowing snow out of their fucking driveway. Let's go down to their house and ask them if they have a fucking dishwasher. <laughs> I'm guessing they got both. Like, why do I have to choose between a snowblower and a dishwasher? <laughs> And then I realized the error of my ways and that I ran my mouth too much and that I apologized and kept shoveling. <laughs> <laughs> I have I have a snowblower. It is an electric snowblower. It uses the same 12 volt batteries as the electric lawnmower. I love the electric lawnmower. You know, I've got it, it's a city lot, so it's it's you know two tenths of an acre. It's not big, so the the electric lawnmower works great on that. The electric snowblower, um, for the most part, like today, it worked really well. Four inches of snow, that's that's pretty doable. That's pretty man manageable for it. But man, sometimes when we get like ten, twelve inches, and it's the the heavy wet stuff, uh, that thing is worthless. And well, what I and what I discovered the first the first snowfall of the year, it was also two below so it was really really cold and what i found is that thing is maybe not a a trait you want to have in a winter implement uh but when it's really cold that thing just doesn't want to work at all which is not surprising mm, like right. you know electronics don't work really well when it's really freezing cold anyway uh but that thing just did not want to work the first one so worked great today when i had four inches on the ground a week ago when I had 10 inches on the ground, not so much. And that's when I was shopping. So, so yeah, the, the exact. Well, exact I learned, uh, I, I learned uh, my first lesson was, is to figure out which way the wind's blowing and make sure that you kick the snow that direction instead of the <laughs> opposite direction. Yes. Uh, wheeled that thing around and went one time and I, all of a sudden, man, it was like an Arctic blast of snow right back <laughs> in my face. And I was like, God. Yeah, you're so stupid. What are you doing? And then you know you look around, make sure nobody's watching you. Right? Hey, you know and I'm I, cold all the time, anyways. Like I, you would think being a big guy, like you know, 280 pounds. Well, when I was 460 pounds, and everybody'd be like, "Well, you should be really warm." Why? Because I'm fat. <laughs> I just have more surface area that fucking gets cold. Yeah, my liver is nice and toasty right now. The rest of me fucking cold. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> everyone's always like, oh, you know, you uh you've got a beard that's gotta keep you warm. I'm like, no, the beard's the first thing to freeze. Right. <laughs> right. Just, you get the little saliva in there, next thing you know, you're walking around with some ice crystals on your lip. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's it's hard as a rock. And I mean, don't even get me started on that whole fucking wind chill thing. That's a whole <laughs> myth. If it feels minus 10. It's fucking minus 10. My friend Chris and I argue every time about it. He will like text me out of the blue. He goes, hey, did you check the windshield today? Don't bring up that fake fucking science, dude. It's fake. <laughs> They're making stuff up. It's not real. If I walk outside and it feels like minus 15, it's fucking minus 15. It's not 12. It's minus 15. Yeah. Well, and I, and I will not hear any other argument about it. <laughs> Windshield is made up. It's something that the meteorologist sat overnight and go, let's just make up this bullshit so that we can break in again and talk about stuff that doesn't, it, it's not real. You uh, want to talk about fake news and fake science. Coronavirus, real. Windchill, bullshit. <laughs> 
I love it. This is not a conspiracy theory that I have heard before. Uh, so, that I'm not uh, kidding you. That big weather is conspiring to, to make us <laughs> believe it is warmer than it really is. That's right. <laughs> They're all got stock and and, muff, uh, and mittens and and coats and grocery stores. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. I like that. Uh, <laughs> I don't even. I don't even know where to go from here. That's fantastic. Uh, well, the fact is, is to, to transition to what we're going to talk about, I, I cannot, since I got sick, I cannot seem to stay warm. The mm-hmm. cold, I think, affects me more since I got sick to the point where in recovery, I would be laying in bed and my wife and I would have the electric blanket and I'd have flannel pajamas on and it kicked to 10 and I was still kind of shivering and she's over there like cooking so I, my body's all messed up. <laughs> yeah, like, so I was talking about this with someone earlier, um, and it even got brought up. I I mentioned on, on Twitter about the electric blanket, and they said the electric sleeping pad is where it's at. I can't do an electric sleeping pad. I'm one of those people that likes to be simultaneously toasty warm and cold when I sleep. Yeah, Got to have the fan on. <laughs> right? Like right? If, the, if the room is too hot, I'm not going to sleep well. Right. But I still want to have an electric blanket in a freezing cold room. I, I'm, you know, like I'm actually a pretty good winter camper because I like to be both cold and then bundled up. I, uh, I can't, I can't do both. I, you know, and that's, you know, maybe that's a quirk about my body, but yeah, I, I, I can't even imagine kind of what the, <laughs> How confused your body must be. Maybe that's just the, the most simple way of putting it. Right. <laughs> well, it went through some it went through some major trauma there for a while. So yeah, so so let's let's go ahead and and kind of jump into that since we're gonna talk about that tonight. And it's something that that you have brought up on the podcast before, but you know, haven't talked a whole lot of it in depth about. Um, but it's something that, you know, you've brought up recently talking about the holidays and thinking about all the things you're grateful for and, and thinking about, you've there's just been a lot of milestones here, right? So you recently turned 50. We're at the end of a year and what a year it's been. You're, you're already going to kind of be introspective and looking back and thinking about everything that, that we've gone through. And, and I think one thing that you've done not just for yourself, but for me to kind of give perspective is to talk about everything that you went through from kind of diagnosis to recovery. So, um, yeah, I, you know, this is kind of your time to to share a little bit more, uh, about all of that and, and kind of the perspective it gives you. Well, if anybody follows me on social media, the last three years, um, has been kind of a, uh, a journey for me um, to kind of tell this story. For, the, for those that don't know, uh, in September of 2017, I was diagnosed with stage four esophageal cancer. Um, so, you know, let's just talk about um, that month, that summer to leading up to it first. So, <clears throat> well, previously about a year, a year before that, um, uh, Stacy and I were on uh, a small little honeymoon or not honeymoon anniversary vacation with some friends of ours down at the local Bo- Lake of Ozarks. And we had, um, we had decided we wanted to go hiking. And at that time I was probably pushing 340, 340 pounds. And I remember, uh, well, there's a, there's a picture, which I could probably find and post at some point, but I looked at it and I was like, oh my God, dude, you have let yourself go. Like, you know, when I met Stacy in 2009, I was at like 210 pounds. I mean, I really let myself go. Um, so I told her, I, I remember we came home and I was laying in bed. I said, I promise you, I'm not, I'm not ever going to, I won't ever look like that again. Like, not that she cared what I looked like, but like not being able to go on a hike with you and not being able to, um, you know, just enjoy our anniversary and sure. and be winded going up the stairs. I, 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 I promise you I won't. That won't continue. 
so I, uh, we got through the fall and then in the spring of that year. So let's see what year to that in the spring of 2017, uh, my neighbor across the street, um, who was, uh, probably about, I don't know, a little smaller than I was, um, was telling me that he had started, uh, Farrell's kickboxing, Farrell's, uh, extreme body shaping. And he had a free week coming up that I could go to a free week at. And so I went with him and kind of liked it. Um, I hated gyms, hated going, I hated working out, hated gyms. Um, but I just knew that I had to do something. So, uh, I had decided that I was going to do their 10 week challenge, uh, that started that summer. So I came back from vacation and started the 10 week challenge and went the entire 10 weeks and didn't miss one class except for once. And I went to Nickelback concert the night before with <laughs> Gabe. <laughs> oh and, boy! Um, you know, you do things for your daughter. She wanted to go to a concert. Went to Nickelback. <laughs> they got some good shit. <laughs> no, I look. If if I had already put um, my ears and brain through that the night before i don't think i'd want to put my body through any more punishment i think the, the night before would have been punishment <laughs> enough <laughs> oh so i i uh i did really well it was surprisingly something that i i i found a niche in and they don't give like the winner obviously deserved to win she killed it and won a thousand dollars but there were a couple of people that told me that I was pretty damn close to win it. So I, I told Stacy, I said, I'm going to keep going. I said, I've lost 15 pounds here. I've gained muscle. I feel better. I, I feel amazing. So about four weeks later, I, we had this big, huge project at work. We were, um, as I said before, I'm in property management and we were taking over about 30 properties all in one day, which was unheard of. We never do that. We would always, you know, if we took over a property, it might be once a week once a month, something like that. But this was a pretty big deal. It was 30 properties um, in one day. And, you know, you have to have websites ready, um, portals ready, you know, lead tracking systems ready, all that stuff. And I was all in charge of that. And I had been doing some double duty with the IT department too, because I used to work in IT and they needed to set up, you know, I don't know, five or six PCs per property mm -hmm. in a span of a few days. So I told my boss, who was heading the IT and marketing department both that I would help with that. So I jokingly the day before said, Hey, uh, don't be alarmed if I call in sick tomorrow, because tomorrow's going to be a shit show. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I woke up uh, that morning. It was probably two 30 in the morning and I went in to go to go pee. And um, I fell in the bathroom and hit my head and I kind of woke up and I thought, man, and I walked back into, uh, or no, I, I, I think I fell twice. And the second time I yelled out to Stacy and said, say, honey, I think I just fell. And she came in and she's like, what? And I was on the floor and she lifted me up and said, I think I just fell, but I had only thought I fell once. She said I fell twice. So I must've got up, fell again. And I'd hit my head um, on the towel rack and had a big cut down my forehead. So, um, I went back to bed and I laid in bed and I was fine. And I said, I'm going to go in and go back to the bathroom. So I got up and walked in there and I sat down this time to use the restroom. And I just, I just felt disoriented. And I was like, and I started, I thought maybe there was some cleaner that was open, you know, with some fumes or something. Sure. And I said to Stacy, I said, honey, I think I'm going to pass out again. And I got up and I fell over. So she took me back and put me in bed and I was fine. And she goes, I'm going to call the cops. And I was like, no, don't. Or she goes, I'm going to call the ambulance. I said, don't call the ambulance. I got all this shit to do at work tomorrow. I'm fine. Really, I'm fine. Look, let's have sex right now. I'm fine. <laughs> I'll show you how fine I am. <laughs> She's like, no, I'm calling. So she, she called the ambulance and they came over and I was like, this is total bullshit. I was like, it's fine. I don't know. And in my mind, I thought, well, she had been sick the week before she had had a cold. 
and a sore throat. And I thought maybe I was just getting sick. I'd been working out for 14 days, 14 weeks without a break. You know, maybe I'm just run down. Yep. And, and the guy took all my vitals and I was fine. And uh, he said, uh, and Stacy said, why don't you have him stand up? And I'm like, you know, like, come on, I got, I got to go to work. Mm-hmm. And I stood up and immediately the EMT said, uh, you need to sit back down. I lost all color in my face. I went white as a ghost. And they said, we got, we're going to take you in. And I was like, I can't, I said, I can't miss work. Mm-hmm. Like there's no way. And the guy's like, listen, just get in the ambulance and then we'll check you out. And if you're fine, they'll send you home before you can go to work and you can go to work, but we need to take you in. So I went into, I went into the, uh, into the ambulance and rode to the hospital and uh, they were doing some tests. And I said, I, I got to go to the bathroom again. And they took me in there and sure enough, I had, at that point I had finally passed. I had, I had a bunch of blood in my stool. So I was bleeding somewhere. Mm-hmm. Well, my sister-in-law, Stacy's sister, works in endoscopy at the same hospital. So I actually got sent down there. They were going to do a scope. And um, after the scope, they came out and they told me, they put Stacy and I in a room and they said, uh, they said, we found a, a tumor in your throat, in your esophagus. It's bleeding. And it's stage four cancer. And I was just, I, I, I was just devastated. And they said, it's, well, and this was on Stacy's birthday. It was her birthday that day. And they said, um, they, they said, I have no idea. It, it never, we never catch this at stage four. But something made it bleed or we'd have never found it. Because usually with esophageal cancer, you don't know it until you can't swallow stuff. Like it's so the tumor's so big that you start to hmm. to swallow stuff or whatever. And one of the one of the things that that will pre warn you is really bad heartburn. Sure. So, which I didn't have mm-hmm. because it just wasn't that big. And my sister in law even said, "Some you know Jesus is looking out for you because it never." It's, it's rarely caught this early. Hmm. So he said, we have one of two options. He said, we have an option. I think I can maybe get it out today um, and cut the tumor out as long as it hasn't penetrated the actual esophagus wall. If it's penetrated that wall, then I can't, I can't cut into that. Mm-hmm. And so I said, well, I, I need a minute. Yeah. And I said the first thing we need to do is get somebody here for Stacy because I'm not going to go under a knife and somebody not be here for her. Mm-hmm. So, uh, they called uh, a friend of ours, uh, Angela, Angela came up and sat with Stacy and my friend Ryan, her husband went and got the kids to bring him up there. Well, they, they pulled me in and, um, they said that, uh, they couldn't get it. They tried to get it, and it, it penetrated the esophagus wall. So at that point, I'm like, we're sitting there. I'm crying. I'm feeling sorry for myself. You know, I Tim, years ago before, and we, we have a lot of things we can talk about down the road, and, and not all of it should always be me, by the way, but um, – there was a time in my a point in my life where I had decided I was going to stop feeling sorry for myself. Mm-hmm. Um, but this was one of the times where old Chris came back and I was like, why the fuck does this happen to me? You know what I mean? I, I, how can, how can you not? This is, um, this is, uh, I mean, especially first of all, just cause of the, how rapidly this all developed I had to have just, you know, you're still just dumbfounded by it. So it's not just that it's this tragic diagnosis. It's that it's this tragic diagnosis out of the middle of nowhere. Right. I'm having the best workouts in, in, in physical health of my life. Right. That's what slayed me. You're, yeah. You're feeling better you than, you, than you have in, in forever. Right. Uh, so I, I, 
so I, I remember I was holding Stacy's hand and I just looked at Stacy and I said, I don't believe in a God that would bring you into my life and then rip it apart 10 years later. I just don't believe that. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that I have it for a reason. All I'm saying is, is I, I, I there's no way he's going to take us. He's going to, he's going to put us apart. There's no way. So, um, so they brought the doctors in and part of the problem was is 10 years previously when I was in 2009, I had had gastric bypass surgery. And normally for esophageal cancer, what they will do is they will take your esophagus out. They will just take your stomach and pretty much just pull it up sure. and, your, and stretch your stomach into a tube that now becomes your esophagus. Mm-hmm. Why well, had gastric bypass? They had taken part of my stomach and moved it over and stapled it. And, and now, you know, the wow. surgeon is like, you know, I don't, I don't know what we're going to do here, mm-hmm. you know? So the plan was to do six weeks of chemo and six weeks of radiation. And uh, that would, and then at that time, then he would have enough research and so on and check with some clinics on how to operate after that. And we'll shrink the the tumor down as best as we can. So of course I remember my first night in the hospital room, Caitlin's up there and well, first of all, she ate all my Mac and cheese, which is total bullshit, right? What (laughs) fucking kid comes up and eats their dad's Mac and cheese when I'm in the hospital. (laughs) And she's like, well, it's not like you can eat it. Well, Shout I'm, out to Caitlin for eating a cancer patient's mac and cheese. That's oh, bullshit, right? Wow, wow. And yeah, it, see, everybody thinks Caitlin's all nice and sweet. <laughs> First night eating my fucking mac and cheese. Not not only eating a cancer patient's mac and cheese, but just taunting them about how they can't eat it. Right, right. Yeah. You don't, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, boy, but, Caitlin, um, I think back every nice thing I ever said. That's about. right. <laughs> that's right. Uh, also, I would advise that when you first get diagnosed with cancer, you don't Google blank type of cancer survival rates because that'll oh. throw you into a fucking tizzy. Oh. I I sat there the first night. Stacy stayed in my room with me. It was probably three in the morning and I was on my phone. I was Googling this stuff. And 10%, 20%. I'm like, what the whole, you got to be fucking kidding me. Mm-hmm. Like, there's no way. And I, and I, I remember I was just like, that's, I'm just not, I'm going to, if anything, it's going to take me kicking and screaming. Like I'm not going to just lay over and die. That's just not going to happen. So uh, that first, I, I think I spent, I don't know, five or six days in the hospital. They gave me my first treatment. Well, first let's back up. My doctor, my oncologist, comes in dr tom uh broker and uh he his son is a is an oncologist he's on call he's a wonderful doctor first fucking thing he says to me he walks in i'm wearing my iowa state hat did you go to iowa state yes sir couldn't get into the good school so you <sighs> took the second choice <laughs> That's how we're going to start, Doc. That's how we're going to start this shit. Not exactly a great relationship to start off with. <laughs> and, you know, to this day, every time I go see him, oh, those those clones, they're looking a little better. Yeah, you better speak up, dude. I <laughs> he begrudgingly gives me a little bit. Oh, that's um, funny. But... So between him and, and, and my, I, so I had a, my oncologist, my radiologist, and then my, my surgeon. And the surgeon was, I never met a man that did not have a bedside manner worse than his. I mean, he was just like, I'm, I, don't, you know, I don't know. Right. <laughs> and I was like, so. I, you uh, know, I think, we, I think that's, sorry, I was going to say, I said no. I think that's actually a sign of a good surgeon. Uh, yeah is to be to completely lack empathy, right? Yes. Like, like you want your surgeon to be, uh, for lack of a better term, a psychopath, right? Yeah. You, you want them to lack empathy because they're going to be better. So, I, uh, 
Yeah. So yeah. yeah. No, I looking back and afterward, after talking to him more, I he a wonderful doctor. But yeah, he was just like, I'm, I, you know, I'm not gonna lie to you, I don't fucking know. That was basically what he said. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I never seen it before. <laughs> so so and then I, I had my first uh chemo uh, that night or that day, and um I remember I couldn't sleep. Mm-hmm. And one of the side effects of having chemo is, is that you kind of get insomnia. You don't, the steroids really kick you up. Sure. And so that was a little different, but, um, so the, I went home and, you know, Tim, I didn't miss hardly any work. So I went in every single day at lunch. Well, every Monday I would have chemotherapy and I would go to the John Stoddard um, cancer unit and, uh, I'd go get blood drawn and so on. And then I'd start my chemo treatments and I was probably there six hours. And, you know, that puts your life into perspective. And what I mean by that is, is sometimes you got it pretty fucking good Mm -hmm. because I'm sitting next to every Monday, this little 10 year old boy who was already hooked up to a machine when I got there. And was already hooked and still hooked up to a machine when I left. And the kid wore a mask every fucking day. And he never cried. And he never complained. So I'm just going to tell you. You a-holes out there that don't want to wear a mask because it covers your mouth a little bit. And you can't breathe. Fuck off. Mm-hmm. When it comes to that. Mm-hmm. Got a 10-year-old little, 10 year old little kid over here with cancer who has to wear one so he doesn't get sick and you don't hear him bitching. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm reluctant to say that because I probably have a lot of friends out there that don't want to wear one all the time, but <laughs> you know what? I mean, come on. Right. I mean, that, you look at those little kids, they're tougher than you. Is that what you're telling me? It's, it's, it's a good, it's a good thing to call out though, Chris, you know, we talked about this when we, we kind of kicked this off of, of, you know, you've offered a lot of perspective and, and I think what you're doing right now is, is, is a lot in, in that, that vein. And, and yeah, man, uh, without going too far off, off topic here, I, that bothers me, right? You know, I, I had an uncle who thankfully has survived COVID, but he spent two weeks in the ICU. Uh, he's, he's only 62 which I, I get, no, he's not, he's not, you know, some 20 year old kid, but he's only 62, no other confounding health uh, issues. He's in really, really good shape. He's, you know, former athlete and uh, he's happy that he can go six minutes without oxygen. Um, and, you know, that's, that's a good day for him. And, and just to, to realize that, you know, you know, yeah, you you can't wear a mask. Can you imagine just not, re- you know, really not being able to breathe? This is just a pretend yeah. not being able to breathe, right? So, and so, yeah, when you talk about, you know, a 10-year-old kid going through who, man, you're gobsmacked by all of this. You think, not that 10, 10 years old is at an age where they're old enough to comprehend what's going on without being able to understand it, right? Right. There's no perspective, so they're completely aware of what's going on, but there's no perspective. There's no, you know, you're you're too young to have regrets, uh, but you're you're too old to be oblivious. Uh, so yeah, yeah man, I, I I have to imagine for you because you had just said that you'd been complaining that that had to have been just a sobering uh, experience for it all. Well, my mom. My mom used to tell me a lot when I was a kid, when I would complain about things that I don't have it near as bad as some other people. Mm -hmm. And I always used to think that you're so, that's so unempathetic, but it's so profound Mm -hmm. when I look at it now, you know, and um, I would come home uh, on Monday nights. Well, the, the first Monday night that I came home, well, let's back up. And then every day, so every Monday I would go for chemo. Every day I would go in and do radiation, Mm -hmm. which was 15 to 20 minutes 
every day they would point this little laser. Well, they had given me some, some tattoos on my tiny little tattoos on my body that they then pinpoint the laser on so that it shoots directly at the tumor. And it was basically, it would shoot radiation onto my throat. And I would, I remember I would go in and I'd sit on that machine and they'd hook me up and they'd go out of the room. You know, they shut the big lead fucking doors and everything else. And I'm like, I'm inside of a microwave basically. <laughs> like, oh, well, I'm glad you guys are out there safe. <laughs> you know, um, but I, I remember I said to myself, I'm going to say, I'm going to say a Hail Mary. I'm going to say a Holy, uh, uh, an Our Father. I'm going to say a glory be. I'm going to ask God that he takes these, these machines and these nurses and points them in the right direction. And that if he did that and took care of me, then I would always praise and honor him and everything I did. I made that same prayer every day. And Tim, to this day, I remember after I would say that, I would just have a peace at myself, a calm that was like no other. Like I just knew it was going to be okay. Mm -hmm. So um, we went two weeks and I was sitting in my living room and I was scrolling through stuff. I was, I would come home and I would post something on Facebook, like, Hey, had week two doing strong, you know, whatever. Cause I, I also had the unbelievable amount of, support from friends and family and even my work my work took up a a collection of that everybody donated twenty dollars people could donate twenty dollars if they could wear jeans for the month mm -hmm. and and then my my work matched it and i think i got like forty six hundred dollars from my work oh wow and i i told stacy i said how am i going to dis how can i disappoint all these people mm -hmm. how am i going to walk around here feeling sad and sorry for myself when all these people have all these, these prayers and everything for me, it, my friend Casey Bright showed up at my house one night. This is the power of people and the power of relationships and the power that people have that they don't realize they have just by gestures and kindness. Casey Bright walked, came over to my house, rang the doorbell, showed up and he handed me this bag and he had a bunch of buttons in it. And they said Shipley Strong on it. And he said, I didn't know what else to do. So I made these for you so that you could pass out to all your friends. Oh, wow. I mean, it was, I was overwhelmed to the point where that was my mantra. Like <laughs> I hashtag that. And that was what I lived by for six months. I told Casey later, I said, you know, that was one of the most strongest gifts I had ever gotten. Yes. It helped me that people came over and helped clean our house to make sure that I came home to a clean, you know, to a, 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 a sensitized house you know, so that I wouldn't get sick and people would, you know, I had men from my church that came over and painted my fence that we had just put up all those things, but yep. that was powerful yeah. for me. Well, and, and plus, plus you're Catholic. So you feel guilt now too, because you don't want to let all these people down. So, right. <laughs> so that, there's that, there's that power of, of, of shame of, Oh shit. Now I have to live up to this too. So, uh, um, but for real, that's, that is incredible that, uh, that gesture of, I didn't know what else to do. So this is what I did. Um, I, you know, I, that's awesome. That's, that's kind of, that, that's kind of amazing to hear and a good reminder. Cause so many times when I do see a friend that, that has hit a hard time, I feel, I don't know what to do. And it feels like any kind of gesture or words or whatever feels hollow or awkward or whatever. And it's, it's a good reminder that sometimes, you know, just something like that, that, that shows uh, encouragement or support, uh, man, um, that, that is, that is awesome. Um, that's in, incredible that, that, you know, he thought of that idea. Yeah, it, it was really cool. So that, that second week I was, I was flipping through stuff to just, I don't know, I somehow Googled like motivational speeches or videos or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I stumbled upon this seven minute YouTube video called why do we fail? Mm -hmm. And 
the opening mantra of that was from Rocky Balboa movie, uh, the one of uh, one of the later ones that he had done, where he was like retired and owned the restaurant or whatever. And his kid, um, his kid had confronted him because he was going to fight in this fight, and his kid was bitching and whining about his life. Um, and he said, um, he said that. Um, trying to find it here because it's so good so the kid was bitching and whining about his life and how much it sucked and how much his dad um didn't uh he was embarrassing him Mm -hmm. right by going out and fighting whatever and this seven minute video started off by him saying let me tell you something you already know the world ain't all sunshines and rainbows it's a very mean and nasty place and i don't care how tough you are It will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. You, me, or nobody is going to hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. Now, if you want to know what you're worth, then go out and get what you're worth. But you got to be willing to take the hits and not pointing fingers saying you ain't where you want to be because of him, her, or anybody else. Cowards do that, and that ain't you. You're better than that. And I, I was just overwhelmed. And then it just crescendos into these different texts of speeches of people talking about inspiration and with this music and, and Derek Rose and talking about how he went through an injury and, and, and um, why can't he be the MVP of the league? Why not him? Why not him? And, and it was just, it was powerful. And I was like, man, that is me. Like that's, that's how I want to tackle this. That's how I want to live my life is that I'm not going to, not going to feel sorry for myself. And I think Stacy was in bed and the boys were asleep and I was, I was just moved. And all of a sudden Caitlin came upstairs and she walked upstairs and she sat in the middle of the, of the front room and she just started bawling. And I was like, what's the matter? Because I told her when I got sick, as she was a senior in high school, I said, this is not going to be the year that dad got sick. We're not doing that. Mm-hmm. You know, it's your senior year. It's the boys as they're starting high school. That's what we're going to focus on. We're not focusing on me. Mm-hmm. And she's like, I don't understand why it happened to you. It's not fair. You don't deserve this. And I said, Caitlin, nobody fucking deserves it. Mm-hmm. So nobody, we, and I said, we, we're not doing that. So I'm not saying I'm not validating your feelings. But we're, we're stopping this shit right now. Mm-hmm. We are not feeling sorry for ourselves. And I, and I was like, man, I, I just watched this video. I think God prepared me for this conversation I was going to have with her. Sure. I was like, all these people are helping us. And all these people are here for us. I'll be damned if I'm going to sit here and feel sorry for myself. That ain't happening. I'm going to go in. I'm going to do my job every day. I'm going to go to my work. I'm going to take this this radiation i'm going to take this chemo and i'm going to kick its ass and we're going to move on and that's what we're going to do and we ain't feeling sorry for ourselves so knock it off that's something that um (laughs) that's something that's that's hard to do i you know i i don't know how many times and and i i feel like i've lived a pretty lucky and pretty blessed life uh it's still really easy to kind of fall into a trap on even just the more mundane things uh where you start to feel sorry for yourself because this didn't go your way or that didn't go your way or you know um it doesn't even have to be the why don't I have this or why don't I have that. You know, sometimes it's, it's you know, I get caught up in the, uh, if I could do things over. And someday we'll do a whole episode on uh, if we had a time machine, what we would change about our lives. Uh, uh, but uh, 
Because, you know, if I had a time machine, I wouldn't go back and, like, stop Hitler. Right. <laughs> or, right. you know, all these other terrible things. I would just go back, like, 30 years and talk to young me and be like, no, here's what you need to do. I would, right. I would, I would Biff Tannen. Uh, the shit out of and life. also here's a hundred and here's a thousand dollars you should probably put this on buster <laughs> douglas yeah exactly exactly <laughs> you don't know who buster douglas is but trust me <laughs> you're gonna want to bet that. oh boy uh yes that's exactly that's exactly what i, I would do um but no it's 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 sometimes difficult to remind myself to not feel sorry for myself. Uh, and I think, you know, I can relate to uh, situations being less than ideal and times where my daughter is sad about something and I'm more apt to empathize with her than to encourage her. Um, you know, just cause you feel bad when, yeah, life does suck and you feel bad that your kid feels that way. But Man, that, so that's a hard thing to kind of remember to do. Uh, so, yeah, you know, really hard. Tim. Right? I, there's there were times that I that I certainly failed and wavered, but then that was when Stacy would come in and say, "Look how well you're doing," or "Look at this," or whatever else. She was always a guiding light for that. Um, and and honestly, when you when you really believe something, you can convince yourself of that. I was convinced of it. And I, and I, and I said several times, I said, I, I, and I told Caitlin that night, I said, again, I don't believe in a God that is going to take away all this wonderful thing that we have as a family 10 years later. Does that mean that the next four months aren't going to suck? No, it doesn't. They are going to suck. And there were some times, Tim, when it was, it sucked. Mm -hmm. Um, But there's a, there was a light at the end of the tunnel. I, I just believed it. Mm-hmm. And when you have a deep belief in things like that, it's almost comforting, sure. right? You're, you're almost fooling yourself into thinking it's going to be okay. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that's just as good. <laughs> I, you know? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's kind of like that whole fake it till you make it. Like, right. Even and if I, I was not, there were plenty of times, Tim, when I was by myself, just Chris in my room downstairs scared mm-hmm. a, a scared kid wishing that his dad was there but I, I was not gonna let my family see that mm-hmm. you know even to even to my to my weakest point I was obsessed with the fact that I was not gonna let my family think any of that you know, I it so it it strikes me. What one thing I used to have as as my pin tweet was this joke I made that is not really so much of a joke, but it's that the biggest lie I believed growing up is that someday I would feel like an adult. Yeah, we've uh, talked about that right? several times. And so here you are as this man in your forties, all of this kind of lived experience, this family, uh, these teenage kids um you know very soon to not be kids really uh all of this going on career house wife all of these things you should feel like an adult but in your kind of your quiet times there you are still feeling like a kid thinking melvin could come and give you words of wisdom or you know, I smack upside the head and tell me to quit being such a baby. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Um, I mean, I, it's, it's kind of incredible that, that, uh, uh, no matter how old you get or like how confident you, you get, you know, your kids don't see this and they don't know this, but you still don't know what you're doing half the time. No. <laughs> and so well, it's it's almost funny that we sit there long for our parents and kind of feel like we're that kid and like man 
if I were in high school and talking to my dad, he would say X, Y, and Z. But then there's a part of me that was like, why would my dad know what's going on? He'd probably, you know, he'd confidently give me an answer or whatever. Or like you said, Mel would smack you upside the head. But at the same right. time, he probably put your had. ball in. Get your <laughs> yeah. ass to work. Right. right. Which is the exact conversation I had with Tyler last week. Mm-hmm. Don't think that I don't use my cancer to my benefit <laughs> when she doesn't go to work because she has a, a sniffle or a cold. And I go, listen, I went to work every day when I was going through chemo and radiation. You can go to school. You can go to work with a little bit of cough. Suck mm-hmm. it up. Which is probably unfair, but, you know, hey. I figure I went through it so I get to use it. Right. No, I. Oh, and oh. FYI, Caitlin hates it. I'm not allowed to use the cancer card anymore, even though I tend sometimes try to pull that. We bought. I'll tell you a funny story. We bought uh, our dog Bubba would not fucking shut up. He would bark <laughs> all the fucking time. So I bought this bark collar for him. It was a shock collar. And we're sitting at the kitchen table and I didn't have the heart to put it on him. I couldn't do it. And Caitlin's like, I was like, I wonder how bad this shocks. And Caitlin said, why don't you put it on? We'll try it. And I was like, no, I had cancer. I can't put that stuff on. There. Was, <laughs> and she's like, that was two fucking years ago. And I was like, I, I mean, if you want to hook up a dog collar to some poor bastard that had cancer, then I guess you go right ahead. No, I mean, that is the ultimate trump card, right? It's, I right, mean, it's, I know. It's, it's the, you wouldn't hit a guy with glasses on steroids. Right. Now she's like, <laughs> now she preemptively goes, well, I'd ask you to do this, but you had cancer, so I can't. <laughs> and I'm like, you can't use my own stuff against me. That's not fair. You can't, you can't use my own material. I, uh, come up with your own shit. I don't, I don't blame you, Chris. I would be using that all the time. I, I know, right? Right? No, it that uh, I recently rewatched the the episode of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia where they thought Charlie had cancer and they were all being overly sympathetic. <laughs> and there, there was a part of me, I mean, not, look, I'm never going to claim that I had cancer for sympathy or, or you know, whatever. Right. But there was a part of me that's like, man, I see why he's dragging this thing out before he lets him know he doesn't really have cancer. <laughs> right? Um, so yeah, oh, no, man. no, I, I'm, I'm a much weaker, much more petty man, Chris. I would be, I would be using that. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't take the dishes out. I was just thinking about that time I had cancer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I mean, I still have the scar. I don't know what to tell you. So, okay. Chicks dig scars. So, so you uh, did. Uh, chemo and radiation. How long was that process from? That was six weeks. Six weeks. So okay. that that ended up. We, there's some milestones in there. So got diagnosed on 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 uh, on Stacy's birthday. Caitlin's birthday is the third of November. I finished my last day of chemo the day after her birthday. Chemo and radiation was my last day. Um, I did not. Believe it or not, you, when you when you finish your treatment, you can go and you can ring the bell. Mm-hmm. And I didn't ring the bell uh, because looking back, I think I should have. I didn't want to gloat that I finished in front of people that I was afraid weren't going to finish. Sure. Sure. Looking back, now I think maybe they needed to hear that. Oh, yeah. Right. Right. Just- but part of me didn't do it because I didn't want to gloat my success in front of people that may not be successful. Mm-hmm. Um, so then we transitioned into what are we going to do about surgery? Because the six week was on and then they were going to remove the, the, the esophagus. This is where the sucky part starts coming in. So we go the day. So I had to heal up from that. Well, let's back up. The last week of, of radiation, they had told me at some point, the doctor had told me at some point, we're probably going to have to put you on a feeding tube. And I was like, why is that? And he's like, because your, your throat is going to be so bad that you won't be able to eat. And I go, look, doc, I ain't never missed a meal in my fucking life. <laughs> Let's not jump the gun on that. I think I'm going to be able to eat. 
And he's like, well, you know, we just need to, you know, because a lot of people can't. Well, I will tell you, Tim, I made it all the way to the last week. And I, it was like three or four days of intense, you would swallow some cottage cheese and it was like intense pain. It was so bad. And I remember I finally broke down and I called the doctor and I said, you had said at one point that I could, that you could prescribe me this stuff that I could drink and it would coat the inside of my, my esophagus so that when I eat, it's not as harsh going down and cutting into that. It was almost like a coating that I would drink. Sure. And my radiologist said, yeah, she said, I can call you in a prescription for that. And I went and I got it and it was this bottle and it was like liquid glue. That's I mean, that was the consistency of it. And I'm telling you, Tim, if you've ever tasted melted plastic, that's what that tasted like. It's it's like the Simpsons where Homer drinks candle wax so we can win the chili pepper eating. Contest. Yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> but I mean, it was it was terrible tasting stuff. I'd never tasted anything as bad as this. And I did it twice. And the third time I went to open the bottle and just the smell of it made me want to throw up. And I threw it in the garbage and I told Stacy, I go, I'll take the pain. That's how disgusting that stuff is. I'll take the pain over drinking that again because I can't even get past the smell. I would open it up and I would start to go. Mm. I mean, I would start to heave. So th- luckily that only lasted about, I don't know, three or four days and it started to subside. So then that had to heal for three weeks before I could go in for a consultation. So they sent me to Iowa City. So I go to Iowa City and I meet this doctor and immediately, and I'm thinking he's already researched all this, right? Like I sent him all the stuff. He's got all this stuff. We go in there and he's like, well, yeah, I don't know what we're going to do. <laughs> and, I was, and my surgery was scheduled for the day after my birthday, which was on the 5th of December. And it, that was a week away. And I was like, I was pissed. We left. I was, I was so mad. I was like, how the fuck do they not know what they're going to do? Like they've had six, they've had 10 weeks now. How the fuck don't they know? So he said, I, he said, the, one of two options is, is I can still use your existing stomach or we're going to have to take your colon and use your colon. In preparation of that, I'm going to need you to go in for a colonoscopy. Oh, fun. So that we can check to make sure that there's no cancer in your colon when we use it. <laughs> <laughs> okay so i scheduled my colonoscopy for the day after thanksgiving the day after thanksgiving i drank that fucking colon shit it, it was terrible or the day of no yeah it was the day after so and then i went in the next morning colon's fine you might be able to use it so what do you think i had to do in another week prep the colon again because the colon's good to go. So we may need to use it. So I need you to colon prep again in a week oh, man. on my birthday. Oh man. I had to colon prep. Oh, gross. I swear to God, if I ate one more thing of fucking sugar-free jello, I was going to punch Bill Cosby <laughs> right in the fucking face. <laughs> I cannot even look at jello again. I can't. It's oh. terrible. So day of my 47th birthday, Chris celebrated by drinking a gallon of that fucking colon prep and a bunch of jello. That's what I oh. had. In a cheap ass motel in Iowa City. What's that tell you? <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, I had a weekend in Iowa in a cheap motel in Iowa City where I drank a bunch of weird things and ate a bunch of jello, <laughs> but that's something entirely different. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> talk about regrets let me uh no uh, um man i no i look i i i can't imagine first of all i can't imagine like the the whole having to go on a feeding too i'm such a baby about that thing i get uh a mild sore throat and suddenly i'm like a four-year-old who just got his tonsils out i'm like just give me all the the popsicles and ice cream <laughs> i that, that's uh i can't i can't handle that um but 
man, uh, what a way to celebrate your birthday. Well, to celebrate Thanksgiving, right? First of all, the the big, right. most gluttonous holiday. Yeah. Uh, there is. It is the one holiday. It kicks off this kind of this big holiday season, and it's the one that I really like. Uh, I've learned. That's to, my favorite too. I've learned to maybe fetishize food less, but man it's still one of those like i used to do this thing with my ex-wife's cousins where we would we would weigh in pre-meal and then weigh again post-meal to see how much food we shut ate. up <laughs> that's a great idea <laughs> and it was, it was idea. always funny because the winner never felt like the winner because they were laying on the floor moaning and screaming about how oh much they God. hurt so that totally <laughs> reminds me completely off subject do you ever watch did you ever watch the show wings Oh yeah! Oh, I love wings. Yeah. Did you ever see the episode where Brian and Lowell like? So, what's her name? The ke- the lunch lady counter lady. Yeah. Her mom comes back to town, and she's like a phenomenal cook. So Lowell and Brian have this this uh, contest to see who can eat the most food. Yeah! Oh, yeah! 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 yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Remember that? And they're like they're sitting there the next morning. They're sitting at the cafeteria, and they're like all overstuffed, and they can barely move. And she walks in and she's like, oh, you guys love my food so much. I made you guys some brownies. And then she dropped them on the table and both of them go, oh, God. And and Lowell's like, are you quitting? And Brian's like, I'm full. There's no shame in that. (laughs) So great. Such a good show. Uh, Lowell was uh, one of the all time. um, Oh, that show sucked after Lowell left. It did. Um, you know, uh, I did. I still quote Antonio Scarpacci every now and then. <laughs> um, oh, wow. Uh, Crystal so, Bernard. I yeah. had a thing for Crystal Bernard. Sorry, this has got me off on a whole tangent. Uh, we could do a whole podcast episode on uh, hot chicks that I had to screaming yeah. wet thighs for that were on TV. <laughs> Not to, luckily, Stacy doesn't listen to this. So. <laughs> no, uh, I don't know what it was about Crystal. I she was definitely it was uh, her hair. She had that little poofy thing in the yeah, front of her hair. Little, and, yeah, it was it was definitely a very nineties in her southern accent, right? Oh, the southern accent. Oh man. Okay. Yeah. All right, we're getting off topic here. Actually, um, actually, answer. Just, we're talking about cancer. Yeah. This is probably uh, a good place to go ahead and take a break. We've been talking for a little while. We should probably get a word from our sponsor, uh, Regroup. <laughs> That's um, right. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, we will go ahead and we'll we'll get a word from Deadeye Barbecue Sauce, and we will uh, go ahead and, and you know jump right back into this delightful topic of cancer when we get back in 30 seconds back when i started deadeye i knew i wanted to innovate the barbecue game since day one we've offered a premium barbecue product unlike anything else on the market great and irene had something special tucked away on a recipe card in her cupboard and there was no way we weren't going to do something about it so we decided to take it one step further introducing deadeye Superfood barbecue sauce. We've got five new flavors, graviola, acerola, pink guava, acai, and dragon fruit. They're the first of its kind, and they're packed with flavor. Find it at your local grocer today or at deadeyebbq.com. All right, and welcome back to Old Man Strength a podcast of the Tailgate Society. Before we uh, jump back into things, I just want to remind you folks to check us out on the web at thetailgatesociety.com, on Twitter at Tgate Society. Uh, our old man strength is on Twitter is strength underscore old on Twitter. We don't have an Instagram because we are old. And so and we're cool. Yeah, we're cool. I had a personal Instagram, and then uh, apparently it had got there was a, a login attempt, and it. What is going? What is going on here? Oh my goodness. Um. Okay. Sorry, I'm having a little bit of technical difficulties. I've been having a whole bunch of difficulties. Okay. I got, I got a new phone last week, and I'm too old to understand how to use new phones. 
Uh, I had had a login attempt on my Instagram and it didn't work, but it was with an email address that no longer exists. And so I can't go in and correct it. So I, I'm no longer on Instagram. I don't know how anything works, uh, which is kind of the point of this podcast is just being a clue. That's right. <laughs> so anyway, yes, yes uh, please. Long story short, check us out on the interwebs. Uh, but when we left off, uh, Chris, you were kind of going through, um, you had said six weeks of, of chemo and radiation. You had, uh, were going in. You found out you had a healthy colon, which uh, always look on the bright side of life there, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> The bright side, I made a rule on my birthday. I'm eating whatever the fuck I want every birthday from here on out. Huh? <laughs> Turns out your bright side is where the sun don't shine. So uh, <laughs> so the plan then from here is that they're going to use your colon to repair your esophagus. Is, is that yeah? Is that what the plan is here? If, if they can't use it, then, then they have the colon available. So... So the next morning we go to the University of Iowa Hospital and we're prepping me and things like that. And they wheel me down this hallway and uh, off to the left, outside the window, I see Kinnick Stadium. And I go, well, that's just fucking great. It's the last fucking thing I'm probably going to see. <laughs> Thanks a lot for wheeling me by that. <laughs> Well, no, just, uh, it's just a remi- so, it's just a reminder uh, that if you were going to pass, uh, you, you got one last look at hell before you went to heaven. I think that's the that's way. Right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, uh, so luckily they they were able to not have to use the colon. They used uh, they they were able to use my stomach, so that's good. Um, they were able to get all of the cancer. It was all, um, the, the chemo and radiation had killed it already. So that was good, but I had a very large, uh, opening in my neck and then down my stomach that they had to, uh, of incisions and so on. Um, and I couldn't eat, mm-hmm. couldn't have any solid foods or water or anything for 21 days. So it was straight food feeding tube for 21 days. I was sitting in my room the night of the Iowa Iowa State basketball game. Uh, it was the year that we still had Monte, Matt Thomas, and Naz Long. Uh, Niang had just graduated, so it wasn't. Mm. And um, I was so I, my wife had decorated the entire room with Christmas decorations of red and yellow stuff. Cyclone gnome and a bunch of other stuff in there and screaming loud that we, you know, that we won the game or whatever. And then <laughs> about 10 minutes later, they tried to get me into the bed and I went into AFib. I, I, I'd gotten so excited that my lungs almost collapsed and I went into AFib. Oh, geez. <laughs> and they had like 15 to 20 doctors and nurses in there trying to get me to calm down. Uh, my body just, I had over, I don't, I don't know. I'd overexerted myself or something. I have no idea. And, uh, my wife was scared and I was freaking out. And, um, so they told me I had to tone it down. I wasn't allowed to get so excited, (laughs) but the cool thing was, is that was when my Twitter universe began to explode because I had my, my wife had taken a picture of me before and after, and I had tweeted it out to George Niang and said, look, I was giving these guys so much guff in Iowa City that that uh, a guy, I got, they had to strap me down in a bed, and he replied to me and he was like, <laughs> he was like, that's the spirit or whatever else. And I was like, oh my God, George <laughs> Niang liked my tweet. I'm so excited. Oh, that's, that's funny. Man, I, you know, I joke all the time uh, that if you have a heart condition, you shouldn't be a fan of cyclone athletics. Oh, there's no fucking doubt about that. I mean, I, that Texas football game this year, I don't think I breathed for like a solid 20 minutes. <laughs> the big 12 championship last two weeks oh, ago. God. I never, Tim, never in my life have I ever prayed to God for an outcome of a football game in my life. Oh, and at the two minute so... mark, when we got the ball back, I said a prayer. 
<laughs> so oh, I was pacing so much. Oh, I, uh, I was, uh, went over to, to visit a friend at a brewery. We could drink outside on the patio. Uh, but you could still see the, the big screen, uh, the projector TV, um, inside. So, uh, uh, th- right after that interception was thrown, then I, he put a beer in my hand and I was much happier, but it was a very stressful <laughs> end of that game. Yeah, it was. Okay. So, 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 so 21 days with the feeding tube. Yep. Got um, sent home. Uh, and was home. I had to sleep. Uh, I have to sleep even to this day. I have to sleep elevated. Like mm-hmm. my neck and my, my head has to be above my feet because I don't have, well, I don't know. What's that little flapper thing at the top of your saga is? Whatever that thing is. I don't have that anymore. So if I lay flat, my stomach acid will roll up into my throat and burn into my lungs. And Oh, yeah, yeah. And there's been plenty of nights where I have slipped down or I have not laid in a certain way and I woke up with the most terrible, even to this day, the most terrible burning sensation in my lungs and 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 throat that it's i'm up for hours so are you are you at a higher risk for choking then yeah yeah i would assume since you can't yeah right okay yeah so yeah 21 days no no food or water just a feeding tube and uh i have i had this incision in my neck and um i think i was home three days and, and my leg was constantly in pain. And I even told him when I was in, in the hospital that my, my leg hurt. But they never did anything about it. And then I, I was sitting there one night. It was like the third day I was home. And I, I felt just a little bit of wetness on my wound. And I couldn't figure out what it was. And Stacy was all the way upstairs. And she said, Can you, do you smell that? And I was like, I, I smell something, but I don't know what it is. And she came downstairs and my wound was starting to ooze out. She called my sister-in-law, who's a nurse, my Shelly. Mm-hmm. And she said, she jokes to this day. Well, first let's back up. My sister-in-law, who's a nurse who works in endoscopy, endoscopy had way too much whiskey now. <laughs> Bought me a fucking Joe Dirt mullet wig because she was convinced I was going to lose all my hair. <laughs> and I still have that. I didn't have to wear it. But and some guy at my job one time said, quote, Man, you look really good. You haven't really you've lost just a little bit of hair. And I was like, dude, I haven't lost any. That's what I had before. <laughs> so anyway, Shelly walks in and she's like, uh, I don't even have to come in there. I she's like, there's certain smells that a nurse knows. And that's an infection. So you need to go back. You need to go to the hospital. So we went to, to, uh, to Broadlawns and they wouldn't even touch me. They wouldn't, they called Iowa city and Iowa city said, put him in an ambulance and bring him back. So in the middle of the night, I'm in the back of an ambulance facing backwards for two and a half hours with no concept of time or how far we are. It was the weirdest car ride I've ever had in my life because you can't like you can't see where you're at you have no concept of time right I didn't have my phone so I didn't know you know has it been 20 minutes has it been an hour I mean I have no idea you're not seeing any of those kind of those mile markers right. or those milestones right. you're not like oh now we're good now and oh, poor Stacy right? yeah. poor Stacy it, it was probably 11 midnight uh-huh. by the time they put me in an ambulance and then she had to go home get clothes and then drive back drive to Iowa City So, you know, she drove to Iowa City in the middle of the night. Um, And I get, uh, I get in there and I I made him wait for her. And they said that the whole wound had gotten infected. And Tim, I'm just going to tell you, the worst pain I've ever felt in my life. They gave me two shots of, I think it's called Dilata. Is that, you ever heard of that? It's like a pain killer. Two shots of it. And then they proceeded to cut that entire wound back open. 
because they had to suck all that stuff out. And I'm not kidding you with two shots of that powerful painkiller. I was pounding on the, on the, on the bed. It was so much pain. It was the worst pain I ever felt in my life. Like doc, can you give me a couple shots of whiskey and a leather belt? Right. Something. <laughs> can you give me a cigarette or something after this? <laughs> so they, and then they packed it and then they told Stacy going forward, you're going to have to pull that gauze out because they were going to leave it open. And she was going to have to pull that gauze out three times a day and repack it with clean dressing and clean it for the next 30 days. And she was like, I don't know that I can do that. And they're like, well, I mean, she's like, I know I have to, but, and we would, we would then at night, I would lay in bed and I would like grit my teeth because pulling the bandage off was just that much pain. And they gave me painkillers and things like that, but I'd have sure. to shoot it in my tube and my feeding tube. I couldn't take it. And you, I, I, I mean, it almost felt like I knew what heroin was like because I would shoot <laughs> that stuff into my feeding tube. And in, in about 30 seconds, I'd be like, well, life's not so bad. <laughs> this is pretty nice. Uh, man, whenever I hear stories like that, you know, like I've, I've, you know, heard and seen what some people some people have had to do for similar things like when you first were telling me the story about the stitches i i immediately had worried about sepsis i've known enough cancer patients where your immune system is already destroyed because you spent six weeks on chemotherapy literally killing your body like the whole point of chemo and radiation is to kill living cells right so you're already destroying all of that then you go through surgery and so your body is already uh a, just working to heal. Uh, B, it's already out. And so now, you know, anything can cause uh, a, an infection. Um, but something like changing the dressing on a gross wound three times a day. Nurses are special, special, special oh, people. Dude. That I have so much respect. I could not do their job. They no have way. to. They have to know so much. They have to put up with so much. They have to. To. Well, uh, let me tell you two things. I had a, a my friend at church. His name is Scott Mueller. <clears throat> he was dating a woman who I did not know at the time. Was a traveling chemo nurse, and. She, she, Scott was telling her about me and she showed up to, to, to the chemo ward my, on my first day and she introduced herself and I hadn't met her yet. I had heard about her, but I hadn't met her yet. Mm-hmm. And she said, I just want you to know that I changed my schedule around and I'm going to be your chemo nurse the next six weeks. And she sat with me and took care of me and gave me her phone number and I could text her at night or whatever. And she was a godsend. But I will tell you, this is how amazing nurses are. And when I hear shit like people say, like, this whole frontline things and that in the hospitals and the doctors are fudging numbers for COVID, this is what pisses me off. I went in there every Monday, Tim, and those nurses were so sweet and so nice and took care of every single thing. And you know you know that they get attached to those people. Oh yeah, absolutely. And people die of that disease of cancer or whatever, but you wouldn't know that I walked in there that day and they were nice as pie, but maybe they just lost somebody that they grew really close to Mm -hmm. and they got to change their attitude and put on a sweet face for the next poor sap that walks in there. That's, that's amazing to me. I mean, it's it's the opposite of what we, what we were talking about earlier with surgeons. Like, you want your surgeon to be this cold blooded, heartless, you know, because he has to cut you open, right? And so, you're not surprised your surgeon had a terrible bedside manner. And nurses are the exact right. opposite. They have to deal with being an empathetic, caring person, and yeah. deal with loss on a daily basis. Have to deal and, with you know awful patients, patients that. Because so many times, I mean, you talked about kicking this thing off. You fell once or twice. You thought you fell once. The most mundane, innocuous things can cause uh, disorientation. Yeah. 
delusions, uh, you know, personality changes. I had a friend recently whose mom uh, had dementia after urinary tract infection, which is apparently very common. I, and so they're having to deal with people who aren't, you know, who are of otherwise sound mind in a, in a difficult situation. And I, and I can't imagine uh, every patient is all sunshine and rainbows. Right. So uh, yeah, for them to, to, you didn't even know what they just dealt with. Uh, they right. made you the most important thing at the time that, that, that they were in the room with you. My sister-in-law probably was one of the main important parts of this entire journey. She translated every confusing conversation that I had. Mm -hmm. She would put me at ease. She would tell me the truth. She, I think, pulled some strings so that I had the best doctor uh, in the oncology department. I think because they, she worked in that hospital and they knew her and... Mm -hmm. They assigned me the best doctor. Uh, I owe my life to my sister-in-law to show it. She, listen, there's a reason why Joshua has her number programmed into his phone that says Aunt Shelly Lifesaver. I mean, there's a reason why. Sure. Um, I, wait, wait, you, you let her know this? Man, that is, that is. I, listen, <laughs> Shelly's got a special place in my heart. Here's what's, here's the thing. I love all of Stacy's sisters. Every single time I see one of them, I tell them they're my favorite, <laughs> not in front of the other. Now, really, if we're going to have an honest conversation, Julie is my favorite because Julie likes it when I drop the F-bomb all the time. She told Stacy, Julie was the first one I met, and I told the story of how Caitlin was born, and it's full of F-bombs, and she told Stacy that night, she's like, I don't know. Uh, I, I know you brought your new boyfriend over, Chris, but I just want you to know I really like him because anybody can drop the F-bomb like he can is all right in my book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Which we can have a whole nother discussion. I know. How I, Caitlin was born uh, at home with no doctors. Uh, that's, that's incredible. Because when I was thinking about how amazing nurses are, I was thinking about when my daughter was born. Uh, and how amazing just those nurses are. Um, yeah. Uh, there was no complications really in, in my daughter's childbirth, but still, um, I, you know, I got a whole different respect for nurses after, after that. I, I don't think anyone can, can witness their kid being born and not have some sort of kind of profound, uh, revelation at the time so yes i would like to hear this whole being born at home without doctor story uh it's crazy this is see chris this is why so many of these episodes uh you know you kind of take the lead on kind of a lot of conversation just because you've had a way more interesting life than me <laughs> either that or man i've got the shittiest luck ever uh, well okay so uh back to you just you're basically on the other side of cancer and now you're dealing yeah. with, with uh, infection and, and Stacy's learning that she's going to have to change your, your dressing yeah. three times a day. And so uh, how long what? were you in, in the hospital then? And then, then probably three home? days. Okay. And, so um, and that was actually during, we always get together with her family in Harlan for mm -hmm. Christmas, the weekend before whatever the weekend is before Christmas. And Caitlin had driven the boys to Harlan so that they could be there. And, and Stacy was with me. And I told Stacy, I said, you know what? Why don't you go? Why don't you drive to Harlan? I said, all I'm going to do is sit here and watch football anyways. <laughs> Saturday and Sunday games. Surprise the kids and drive to Harlan and go be with you. Go be with our family and at Christmas. It's fine. So she did. And I'm glad she did. She got to see her family and, and, and the kids needed her and, and so on. And then we came home and the only time that I had ever through this whole process, I mean, I had had some down times or whatever, but the only time that I really, really hit my lowest point was Christmas Eve. Mm -hmm. um, we had, I had a portable thing for my, um, for my feeding machine uh, and I strapped it to my back and we went to Christmas Eve mass. And I, I 
one of the things that I absolutely love about Christmas Eve mass is um, at the four o'clock one, there's a family there, the Phillips family, and they play the trumpets during Joy to the World. And it is the most beautiful rendition of this song I've ever heard in my life. And I just remember just crying in the pew because I was just so exhausted and so tired. And, uh, and as I walked in there, people would come and put their arm around me or whatever. And just the amount of love and support that I was, I really, really was down that night. And I don't know why only because I think I was just exhausted. I just, I think it just had finally all hit me and being in mass and God comforting me. And it was just surreal. Um, and then the next day I got to eat, drink some water and have some jello. So that was, I got, I remember I got jello. I got to have jello, broth, and water for three days. And it was like the greatest meal I'd ever had in my life. Eating like a king. I know, right? <laughs> it was great. So then I got the supplement food and feeding tube for a while and then back and forth. And then at some point I went back to, to Iowa City and um, and had um, got, the, got the feeding tube out and they closed those up and then I was able to eat. Um, and go back to work because I was off of work during the surgery. So for the entire month of December, which one of the things I was proud of was, is I, I didn't miss a day of work for chemo and radiation. I went in every day and, you know, which is what I told them, you know, a few months ago when they were letting people go, I was like, you know, just so we remember if we're letting anybody go, remember the guy that came in here every day during chemo. And radiation. Again, I pulled the cancer card and reminded them, Hey, I went through a lot of shit for you people. <laughs> <laughs> that all happened in a three years you know, ago. Three years ago, but it all happened in in compared to some people that happened in a, in in kind of a fast time frame. Yeah, right. S- September until I'd say January, I was finally you know walking around and 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 recovering it, it seeped a little bit into when January was a good month. Mm-hmm. And then I remember it was February. It was Valentine's day. I came home from work. I was sitting at work and I just kept drooping my head. I was, I just was tired. And I thought maybe I was getting the flu and went to the doctor and it wasn't the flu. And I probably went a month of every day where I could barely like by the time two thirty, three o'clock would go around, I, I was zapped. I was completely out of energy. Mm-hmm. Um, and nobody could tell me what it was. And I finally went to my family physician and we ran some tests and it turns out that I was vitamin B and vitamin D deficient. And we were supposed to go, we were supposed to drive to Disneyland for the kids' like um, choir trip. Yeah. Um, and I wasn't sure I was going to be able to even get around the park. Um, and I started taking some vitamin B12 shots and some vitamin D supplements. And within two days, I was able to make the drive all the way to Atlanta and then Florida by myself without, but that was, I was a little worried there that I thought maybe because that, that leg pain I had, yeah. turns out I had a blood clot. So I was taking Coumadin. Oh, geez. They found a blood clot there and I had to take Coumadin for, I don't know how long. And I thought maybe that was weakening me or something, but that mm-hmm. wasn't it. So between the blood clot and the vitamin D deficiency and which part of that was the feeding tube, I think. Yep. And not getting enough vitamins and so on through that time. And I just depleted myself, but you know what, uh, in that March, after I got back, I went back to Farrell's and I, and I rebuilt my body back up with wow. the great God and exercise and, and, you know, I dropped some pounds. I don't recommend the cancer diet. I mean, it was all right for me, but I don't recommend it for anybody. No, I, well, so I was going to ask, you know, because that went, like I said, as relatively fast as it did. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm sure certainly uh, it might feel fast looking back at it. I'm sure at the time it, it felt like forever. Um, yeah. But uh, how long did it get? So you said, you know, by March, you're, you're back working out. Um, how long did it kind of get 
before you felt uh and and maybe this is a dumb question but before you kind of felt back to normal or as close to normal or as settled into your new normal or whatever that meant. I would say probably April of that year. Really? That quickly? Yeah. I, I had, um, I mean, I was, I was going to the gym and just kind of testing it out or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, and then at that point I had kind of, so all through those four or five months, I was doing a lot of Shipley strong hashtags or whatever. And I remember in 2018, I started hashtagging stuff. Um, cancer didn't win. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I just decided I was going to post a lot of stuff about my family and the things that I'm doing and, and telling my story that if you get sick or whatever, you, you know, you can, I can inspire people maybe, mm-hmm. you know, and I don't mean that in a, in a braggadocious way. I really don't because sure. a, a, a very lovely and wonderful dear friend of mine, Don Minson, who lives three blocks down the street from me, got um, leukemia or no, I'm sorry, lymphoma uh, cancer that April when I started feeling bad and she didn't make it till September and she passed away. Mm-hmm. And to this day, I feel guilt about that. Why would, why would God take somebody so amazing like her away and not and spare me? And so I don't say that in a braggadocious way, but I say it because I really think that God wants me to tell people what he did for me and mm-hmm. what, what a powerful, positive attitude you can do. And, you know, I, 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 if I see something come across my timeline where somebody needs help, I, I throw $25 to a GoFundMe account. I, Chris Williams on Cyclone Fanatic has done a few things. I mean, I remember hearing a story on the radio and I stopped by El Bait Shop and walked up to him and handed him $50 for a cause that he had. Mm -hmm. I, uh, Meg, uh, Megatron on, on on Twitter, she posted last year about somebody that had a, you could buy a hat that this little kid had cancer and her, I think it was her, uh, a relative of hers. And I was like, fuck it, I'm buying one of those hats. And Stacy was like, why, you know, why did you buy this hat? I was like, you know what? I don't know because some kid had cancer and I felt like he could use my $25. Like that's, that's kind of what I'm about now. You is, you, you contributed to our, our bitter units. Yeah. Uh, uh, charity live stream this, this, this year. And we're grateful for that as well. So. Because I keep remembering all these people that have done these crazy nice things for me. Um, when I was sick, people that didn't know me, they set up a meal train, people were dropping off meals to us or whatever else. Those are the types of things that motivate me to keep telling my story. And then there was another girl in my office, Jen Douglas, who got breast cancer. And I talked to her every day and she's doing amazing now. And there, and, and, and hell, the, the, head, the head trainer at Farrell's, who I just quit Farrell's like a month ago, because I'm just going to do something else. She just had a mastectomy, a double mastectomy. I, I, those things are personal to me. And I, and, and it's important to me to tell people that if you set your mind to something and you, and I know that sounds like bullshit, Tim, I know it does. Sure. I know that's a cliche, but I really lived by that. God wasn't going to, God was going to take care of me. And I was going to, I was going to fight this. And if I, and if he gets me through this, I'm going to help and tell everybody I can. Now I know, I know, I know for a fact when I'm on online and on Twitter, I can be an asshole. I can say some terrible things. I can, I can use some colorful language. I can, I can attack maybe sometimes the other side of the aisle, but I really, I really don't mean to do that in any other way than sometimes my passion just gets past me but I'm a good person mm-hmm. and I'm trying to do something here to, to be open about stuff in my life because not because I have, a, and a, not because I want to put myself out there and make it all about me, but because maybe somewhere somebody might have a transgender kid that doesn't know how to handle that stuff. Mm-hmm. Maybe because they have cancer 
and they they're they're confused and not sure what to do maybe because they have a father that they miss all the time and they just want to talk about him i don't know but i know that i heard stories when i was going when i was going through a lot of these things and those helped me yeah yeah i you know i've i've I don't think I can thank you enough. Man, the whiskey is really flowing. Right now. <laughs> um, yeah, no, Chris, I don't. I, I've said it before. I'll say it again. I'm very grateful for your transparency. Uh, you know, uh, one of my favorite things about you is how genuine you are. Certainly, uh, you have said before that that can sometimes bite you in the butt. That sometimes. Uh, you're a little bit more passionate, a little bit more open, a little bit more honest. I get that. I'm 110% that. Absolutely. I think, uh, I think that's uh, why probably we have so many people in our lives in common uh, because of the similarities. We probably gravitate towards similar people. Um, but uh, yeah, man, I, I, you know, one of the things that I, I think listening to to this story tonight that I'm really kind of grabbing from it is, you know, not really the don't feel sorry for yourself or the necessarily, Hey, think good thoughts and you can overcome anything. Um, but I think the power of positive thinking and not that positive thinking makes everything better. Not that the people who didn't overcome were done in by negativeness, like they weren't positive enough, but just the idea that if this is your new reality and this is what you have to deal with and this is what you have to face, isn't it better to face it with a positive attitude than it is with a negative attitude? And I think that made your life better. It made it better... you know, you've talked about the impact on your family, on, on your wife, on your kids. It's very easy to kind of get hung up in negative. And even if it's not a why me, even if it's not a, a feeling sorry for yourself attitude, sometimes it's just, you know, this year in particular, 2020 has been a shit show for a lot of people uh, in a lot of ways. And, you know, for people like me who who suffer from from uh, clinical depression and mental health issues, uh, it it can become an overwhelming and and kind of compounding thing where even if you're not dwelling on on negative things, just living in a less than positive vibe makes you feel like you're going through mud. And, And just the importance of being positive and being confident and and how that that helps you to continue to move forward and i think that that's something i'm taking a lot of um from tonight so again thank you i i I definitely appreciate that we are all human right and we all have our our demons and our and our things we have to overcome and i you know i can't say that that there wasn't a little bit of resentment on me after I got sick and then got better. And I was like, you know what? I deserve this now. And I deserve this. And I, and I, I, there was a little bit there for a while where I was like, I kind of stared death in the face. So at this point, why shouldn't I live my life to the fullest? And so I was really stuck in a rut and this is going to sound, this might sound like petty to some people. But I grew up uh, not with a lot of money. And I grew up, um, like, I, I've always wanted this certain dream car, right? Mm-hmm. And there for a while after I got healthy and whatever, I was like, you know what? I just want to fucking buy it. Like, what am I living for if I can't? And I still live that way today sometimes. Like, I'm working my ass off here. Why shouldn't I have some nicer things? Why shouldn't I deserve this or deserve that? But I mean, I was hell bent on there for a while on buying a fucking brand new car. 
the, this dream car and it's just not practical. Sure. But, and I had to have a lot of conversations with, with Stacy that frankly, if she wasn't there, I probably would have. And I would have made a bad mistake and by a bad financial mistake or whatever else. You were going to have um, both the snowblower and the dishwasher. Right. And, and a Mustang <laughs> convertible. That was my, right. Yeah. But, uh, it's just, I mean, you, you, you sometimes get in a rut or you, you think that I, I mean, I just, I don't know. It's hard to explain other than the fact that I was there for a while. I was kind of depressed in that. I just kind of felt like I, I deserve something, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And after really thinking about it and, and working through that, you don't deserve anything in this life other than what you work for. And when you have a positive attitude, just having, you said a little bit ago, just having a, you know, there's a lot of people that may not have a positive attitude that still battled and still won. Just having a, a positive attitude doesn't guarantee that you're going to win. Uh -huh. It gives you a leg up. It yeah. makes you get up in the morning. And that was part of it for me. Yeah. It made me want to fight harder. I, it wasn't so much sometimes a positive attitude as it was a fear of failure. And we've talked about that before too, my fear of failure. Right. I didn't want to fail. I didn't want to fail Casey Bright who thought it was enough to send me buttons. I didn't want to fail all those people at my job that, that pitched in $25 to help me out. I didn't want to fail my friends, Ryan and Angela and Tim and Sarah who did things for me. I didn't want to fail my friends, Randy and Brian and, and, and Jeff, who, you know, when I was first sitting in the hospital room, all came and, 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 and prayed with me. I, I didn't want to fail those guys. I didn't want to fail my, I certainly didn't want to fail Stacy. Yeah. Um, because of all the faith and love that she gave to me and the, the fear of failing for those people was a motivating factor for me not to want to quit. So when you have that, then then you see a clearer path on how you fight. And I remember I was, it was probably four weeks in and I was sitting in the, in my oncologist's office after Dr. Broker was talking shit about the Hawkeyes and we finally <laughs> got down to business. He said, how are you doing? And I said, I don't know, doc. Why don't you tell me how am I doing? Cause I don't know. I said, I, I think I'm doing okay, but you're the expert here. How am I doing? And he said, you know, if I sat down and wrote a script for somebody, I couldn't have wrote a better script than what you're going through. And that was pretty profound. Mm -hmm. I knew I was on the right track at that point. And the, and, 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 and you, it might sound crazy, but you know, the other thing that kind of got me through that 2017 cyclone football team. Mm -hmm. Cause I remember feeling fucking miserable that morning that, that, that they were going to Oklahoma yeah. My sister was in town and she was camping down in Indianola and I didn't even watch the first quarter. I went down to see her cause I was like, we're going to get fucking waxed. And I remember coming home and watching that game and just having so much pride and so much like, man, if they can go down there with a third string guy and pull that off, that's inspirational. It, it, it really was boy. Someone asked me, because we didn't learn that that Kyle Kemp was going to be starting until right before the game started. And no, the, the week before was a Thursday night game. Remember, they played yeah. Texas. Yeah. That was my first night home, Tim. I had two TVs going. It was the Texas-Iowa State game and the Chicago Bears-Packers game, and we both laid an egg. And I remember I was so <laughs> fucking mad that night. I was unconsolably pissed off. I was my first night back from the hospital after I gotten diagnosed. And it was, it was fucking horrible. I was so mad. I, I was gonna, <clears throat> See, I'm all worked up now. Jaquan Bailey fucking sacks that guy, celebrates, gets a flag. The whole fucking thing was a nightmare. I, I was going to, I was going to say, man, as, as a, as a long time Iowa state fan, a long time bears fan, I would think that that suffering and misery would be old hat to you. <laughs> oh, don't think that I don't know that the ass job screw is coming this Sunday when we play the Packers. Don't worry. I'm already bent over waiting for it. <laughs> I don't 
know, somebody on Twitter uh, the other day, I think it was Matthias on Twitter the other day, showed the clip of them of, of Rogers throwing that game winning touchdown pass in 2013 in the NFC championship game. And I was like, why the fuck are you showing that? Why would you do that to me? Why would you do that to us? I don't need to see that again. You know, man, I'm a Vikings fan. So every time Gary Anderson gets mentioned uh, uh, or Blair Walsh or any other uh, sure. Double doink. Uh, sure there, I'll, I'll give you one. Double doink. There you go. <laughs> Chris Parkey. Yeah. Well, okay. So uh, All anyway. Right, moving on. Cancer. Anyway, we're talking so, about. Yeah. Come on. Let's get back to the uplifting subject of cancer. <laughs> That's right. Uh, let's forget about the the downer that is <laughs> NFC that, that football is, or right. NFC North football. Let's get back to the real exciting. Uh, anyway, so uh, three. Do you do you have like an official date that you kind of commemorate of? Uh, you know, I know for some people they kind of have like a on this date I was cancer free, but on other people it's not as clean cut to of a me, line it was a, to me it's the day after my birthday okay <clears throat> because they had told me that the cancer was dead that they had pulled out of there and i knew at that point i was i was free sure um <clears throat> i went every six months for a for a scan <clears throat> excuse me i went every six months um for a scan after that and was clear um and you you know it's a little nerve-wracking you're never sure i um, I had a friend that I lost earlier this year that was declared cancer free not even nine months prior to yeah. it coming back in her, her passing. So yeah, I, I, yeah. so I get um, it. the last full scan I've had was uh, December of last year, uh, 2019. Uh, and then I had just a consultation. I didn't have to go through a scan in June and I have another one next month, I think. Um, but as far as he's concerned, I don't have to do another scan, just consultations to ask me how I'm feeling. Do I have certain symptoms, things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, um, it's over. I mean, I, 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 um, I hashtag 2018 as cancer didn't win. 2019 was a hashtag of cancer still, still, still is a loser. And um, 2020, I decided to just drop it because it doesn't define me. Mm -hmm. And I moved on. And look what a shit show 2020 is for now. (laughs) Should have hashtagged something. Uh, Yeah, man, I don't. I don't know, man. Um, 2020, wear a fucking mask. That should be the hashtag. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Uh, Just. Yeah, that's that's a whole that's a whole other thing. Uh, you know, I have a friend that that is uh, 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 in a clinic daily, and and she's very just exhausted and at her wits end. Um, I I have nothing to offer her other than just a few curse words to, of of yeah. support, um, but. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I. I mean, I. I. I can't imagine. I. I really appreciate what you said, though. Is that it no longer defines you, right? Because it's obviously something that is life changing. You obviously know a number of people that had it beat and it came back, or things like that. There's still just a ton that we don't know. Uh, my good friend. Um, well, so our, 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 our mutual friend, uh, Josh, your neighbor, uh, one of his good friends growing up is a, yeah. a PhD, um, uh, cancer researcher. Um, and, uh, brilliant, brilliant guy. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> there's just so much that we still don't know. Right. Uh, for everyone who got lung cancer because of smoking and there was a various obvious cause, there are millions of people who got con- cancer and it's, it's, it's idiopathic. No one knows why they got it or how they got it. Uh, and sometimes that can cause a lot of questions and confusion and, and make 
just the confusion that much more challenging. It's one thing if you know, hey, I got a disease from X, Y, and Z person, or I caught it somehow, but cancer isn't, you didn't catch it. It wasn't a communicable disease because someone sneezed cancer on you, right? Right. Um, Couldn't tell you where I got it. Yeah, you don't know, right? And and so for, for, for I ha- would have to imagine that that even when you're in the clear, you never feel quite in the clear, quite like you did before, right? No. Um, and so it, it feels great to me to, to hear you say, you know, this no longer defines me. And I'm, I'm sure it's still, it's still, there's no way it can't be top of mind, but I really appreciate that, that you've been able to, to make, you know, forge kind of a new path from this. Uh, and that's just an incredible kind of part of the, of, of this story is that, uh, uh, man, I love that you don't have to go in for, for scans. And I love that, that, you know, it's forever going to be part of kind of your history. Yeah. Uh, but you're at this able point, to... I'd rather look at it as, as a journey of how I got closer to my faith than mm-hmm. it is um, cancer. So I, I, I appreciate that you're able to, this is going to sound really, God, this is going to sound really corny. Um, like we don't have one of those moments every episode. Yeah, I know, right? Uh, I appreciate that you're taking something and that you're allowing it to be part of your history without being part of your future. Absolutely. Um, I think that's kind of a, a, an incredible takeaway from all of this, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Tim, I I, I always appreciate uh, the conversation, the friendship. Uh, I think we have some exciting stuff to to come up in the next few episodes. Um, yeah, anything you want to give a teaser for? Yeah, I, I, let's. I I've got we've got a few things lined up. We've uh, got a super cool story uh, about uh, living your dream. Uh, my high school uh, buddy opened up a brand new distillery here down in uh, Osceola, um, Iowa, called Revelton. And uh, he's going to come on and, and talk about uh, whiskey and and um, and his beginnings and things like that. Um, <clears throat> I might might be able to have on uh, a future Olympic wrestler, U.S. or Olympic wrestler on. That sounds pretty cool. And you know, we we still got to get to the episode with a bunch of Melvin stories. Oh, Everybody's abs- clamoring for some more Melvin stories. We got to have some Melvin stories. Absolutely. And and you know? now that I know that I have an inside source from your childhood. Uh... Yes. <laughs> well, let me tell you, let me tell you not a Melvin story. I'll tell you a lightest story with, with, with Bill. So uh, Bill Willers, uh, I went to high school with, um, played soccer with. His dad was my soccer coach. Uh, his mom and dad were our neighbors. I loved, uh, I loved them, Chuck and Mary. And my mom, God love her, man, she was, she's a crazy one, decided <laughs> one time to paint the driveway green. <laughs> I don't know why. Yeah, what? what, um, what, what I, was, dude, what I could not tell you why. <laughs> she, my mom liked to decorate. Like, I would come home from school one day, and the fucking furniture would be rearranged. Like we couldn't afford new furniture, but if she moved it around, then it was a whole new living room. I don't know. I, you no, know, I, I, I get that. I so I, I literally came across a painted driveway <laughs> on my walk today, and I chuckled thinking about your mom. So, so she, uh, she painted it green. <laughs> um, and out of the blue, there's a knock on the front door, and Bill Willers is standing there on the front porch with a putter and a golf ball, and he all he says to her is, "Is." Hey, miss, could you tell me where hole number one is is to your new miniature golf course out here? <laughs> and oh, I thought chilly. she was going to choke him. God, I was laughing so hard. Uh, oh, uh, man, it was so funny. Uh, he really does have the best. Um... I got so drunk at his wedding. <laughs> God, he really does have just a hot. fantastic, draw, like sardonic sense of humor. Oh my god, it was hot. We rode the trolley from Drake University to I can't even remember where the reception was, and we drank a bunch of Lion and Krugels on the. We had to stop 
and buy more beer on the way to his, it was, man, it was, well, I got so drunk. <laughs> that was crazy. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, good. Uh, no, I'm, I will be, I will be checking in with Bill periodically to get, uh, uh, a few more stories see what else i can get uh we have a few other things kind of planned uh we're gonna probably have to do uh um an ode to, to dad life here at some point where we talk jean shorts new balance uh shoes and the proper grilling attire uh <laughs> <laughs> that's right so uh our summer topics yeah exactly so yeah, we have we have a proper lot proper lawn care, whether oh. you should go diagonally or right or in a square. I mean, yeah, you have to mix up a mowing pattern. You don't want to develop a rut. You don't. It's it's like folding something. You don't want creases, mowing your lawn, and don't do the I same swear, thing. <laughs> I'm those guys in that commercial where it's like an insurance commercial, and the guys hired to teach them not to be their parents. Yes, and the, and the oh. guys like. His hair's blue and he walks by blue. Blue, see blue, it. blue. We all see it. Oh, oh. I you love hired that. him to do the job. You don't have to tell him how to yeah. do it. You hired him. Using a spanner wrench, huh? Good job, Steve. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I that that campaign has been out for a while uh, in various forms, and I've loved every single one of them. There was one earlier I, where it was like a support group, and, and yes. uh, one guy's like, why are the windows open? Are we trying to air condition the entire neighborhood? <laughs> <laughs> I've delved into uh, TikTok a bit and I've ran across this stream of people, these guys, and they're like, he's on the phone and he's like, don't bother me right now. I'm doing dad shit. And then like this hard rock music plays and then he goes around and starts flipping all the lights off and, and turn, turning the thermostat down. <laughs> And every time I run across when I send it to my kids, I was like, this is totally me. And I'm speaking, we'll wrap it up with this. So Christmas, the first thing I do is I go get a fucking trash bag. So we don't got the fucking shit all over the place, the wrapping paper. And Caitlin started sending me these TikToks of these dads that are like in the trash bag. You put it in here. And there's like, oh, she's like, oh my God, I thought it was only you, but it's apparently every dad. You can't even I, open a present up without throwing it in the garbage. I saw a TikTok of of making fun of their dad hanging up Christmas lights, and I felt very seen this year. Uh, I, oh yeah, I think you know trying to untangle those things and why are they out? Uh, there are curse words that I did that you didn't even know existed. I invented this year uh, yeah. when it came to, to Christmas lights. So. Um, all right. Well, good. Uh, on that note, uh, we thank you guys all for listening in 2020. Uh, by the time this is out, it should be 2021 and we can put all this nonsense in a rear view mirror. <laughs> I right. shouldn't say that out loud, but no, we do appreciate you guys listening to old man strength, a podcast of the tailgate society and brought to you by dead. Eye barbecue sauce. Please check them out on the web at dot Check us out at the tailgatesociety.com. Check us old man strength out on Twitter at strength underscore old. Uh, Chris, you are Psy Dad, Psy Grad. Yep. Uh, I am Tim Johnson, MN, because there are 7,000 Tim Johnsons within five feet of me right now. Uh, that's where you can find me. Don't look for us on Instagram. We may lurk on tiktok but you probably wouldn't want to see any tiktoks we have but please go ahead and check us out <laughs> anyway and we will talk to you guys next time i don't want to get on the bandwagon i'll burn that wagon down and join the band traveling troubadour terrorizing street corners just to try to get some supper in our hands now I waited all my life to get this off my chest screen buddy murder until someone understands that it ain't about the money, the drugs, or the women. I make this noise just because I can. And we'll all join in to that original sin.